So, good morning. Um, I am going to talk today about uh, how long has this coronavirus been around? If you look at pandemics, uh, most pandemics, especially for a totally novel virus like this, most pandemics, as you start looking, you'll find evidence that it was actually around before we thought. Now, a lot of people, including a lot of scientists, and, or at least docs, early on thought, oh, this has been around for months. I personally don't think so, because again, you see how quickly it spread throughout the, the world. Uh, it hasn't taken that many months to spread. So I don't think it's been around since early 2019 or before at all. Now, surely coronavirus has, but coronavirus is a large family. We've had coronavirus for years. Uh, two of the more common versions of cough, seasonal cough and cold are coronaviruses. In fact, more than two. But anyway, we're going to get a little bit deeper into that whole, uh, that whole thing in a few minutes. That's going to be the major program for today. Upcoming topics include uh, when you recover from COVID-19, the serious infection, are you just, you know, you're out of the hospital and you're feeling good the next day? Mm, not at all. It takes time. This is uh, create, it, it racks the body and it does significant damage and it takes significant, significant time to heal. Uh, as we know, the coronavirus is attacking not only the lungs, it attacks the bloodstream of the immune system. And we'll get a little bit more into depth on that in upcoming videos. Uh, who is not talking about and who does not have a position about when the state should open up, when should we get back to work? When should we start uh, pumping air, revi reviving, resurrecting that dead economy? Big, big issue. And because it involves the economy on one side and a lot of death on the other, there's a lot of emotion there. Um, <clears throat> telemedicine, you know, I, I continue to get frustrated because I was doing telemedicine 10 years ago, have continued to pound that drum of uh, telemedicine. And you know what? We still, even though we knew it, we, we've been providing it for a while. We've grown slowly compared to my aspirations. We've helped hundreds, thousands of people actually understand that they have risk for heart attack and stroke, the major uh, killer and disabler. But even thousands is simply a drop in the bucket compared to the number of people that are burning up their arteries. Previous topics, herd immunity. Can you do that without vaccines? Mm, that Once you begin to study the details, there's gonna be a lot of death involved, a lot of infection, a lot of death if you do that, try to do that without vaccines. Um, a mutant, more contagious coronavirus uh, being reported by Los Alamos labs. The dentist's office, we had a very popular video by uh, where Doug Thompson, a dentist, he's a globally known dentist, uh, has been involved in helping uh, other dentists figure out what they need to do to open up safely, to protect both themselves and also therefore their patients from COVID-19. 
um, inaccurate death certificates. It's an old, painful subject for somebody like me um, because, again, very few death certificates actually report the root causes of these of the problems that we have. Heart attack, yes, that's a that's a problem, but it's not really the root cause. And the vast majority of heart attacks, it's what? Unrecognized prediabetes. So COVID-19 condition emerging in children. We've talked about that a couple of times. We continue to get updates and information on that. So we've got a lot, of, a lot going on in that area. But before we get started and before Carl does our, uh, our water ball, ball intro to the program, I just wanted to make a comment. I was out running again yesterday and continued to think about this issue of, yeah, again, we may have helped thousands of people, but that's not even a drop in the bucket compared to the number of folks uh, that are burning their arteries up. If you're over age 30, you're probably doing that already. More than a one in two chance. Again, I'm not making that up. I'm quoting data. Uh, UCLA. If you're over 60, it's more like a two thirds chance over 70. You know, then you in the 50s, 60s and 70s, you begin to get into the common knowledge. Which, like most common knowledge, has some inaccuracies to it. The common knowledge that you're likely to die from a heart attack or become permanently disabled from a stroke or die from a stroke. in your 60s and your 70s. Well, the reality is, yes, you are, but it's not the reality that that has to happen. These are preventable. And um, you put that together with uh, me pushing that, that agenda, trying to get folks to understand this and prevent their own problem, their own death, their own disability. Uh, part of that frustration gets balled up in terms of um, of telemedicine. Again, I've had access to anybody in the world and we clearly do have global, uh, a global practice. But again, just not reaching nearly as many people as we'd like. One of the reasons is this, it's so darn expensive to see us. And most, of, most folks have up until recently uh, seen us through a one-on-one -on -one type of evaluation. It has to be expensive. You know, I'm just, there's only one of me. And we, we started recruiting other docs. We started getting folks uh, who can do this, uh, making them available, but it's still expensive. You know, our lowest price for a full fee activity is close to $1,000. So one of the things we've been continuing to do is trying to figure out how we can help just do a specific rifle shot issue on the thing that is really killing people. And, and it's not a full-blown uh, preventive examination, full-blown preventive evaluation, but how can we get people exactly what they need? And that is knowledge about um, prediabetes, knowledge about insulin problems, knowledge about um, cardiovascular inflammation. We've started doing that with our um, with our uh, webinars. Those have been very, very popular just coming out of the blocks. And we've been working on and talking about how can we do this, make it a very affordable uh, on a subscription basis. So that's what I uh, wanted to announce today, that we do have a couple of subscriptions, uh, memberships that we're making available. One is a very simple one, uh, silver membership. Enjoy the, uh, the benefits uh, for the month, Ed, access to our educational courses. We've got uh, several of them. We'll continue to build those. We've got them on cardiovascular inflammation, uh, insulin resistance, uh, how you should and should not plan to uh, predict your heart attack uh, risk with plaque evaluation. A private webinar that's going to be exclusive to, to those silver members and uh, access to our supplement store. Again, the quick, easy way, the easy button for figuring out what supplements help uh, in terms of your specific conditions. We'll also have a gold membership. That's for folks that say, you know what? I really want to get deeper. I want to understand, am I one of those majority that has prediabetes, but I don't know it. And my doctor doesn't know how to, how to find it. Uh, in that one, um, 
It's a minimum three month. We have a script for the Freestyle Libre involved with it. Uh, lab orders for the inflammation panel, the OGTT, the insulin survey or insulin responses. Um, and a, uh, a 30 minute one on one appointment with me to start getting focused on. Are you one of those people that's burning your arteries? So uh, if you'd like to find out more information about it, uh, visit this this uh, website or call the number 859-721-1414. Or you can email us again, providing providing all the access we can to try to try to deal with this issue. Uh, back to uh, previous announcements. We've we've covered this several times. Uh, remdesivir is the the major uh, medication treatment for COVID that's uh, that's out there right now. Although I am getting busier and busier, I'm up, up to, again, 12 and 16 hour days trying to manage this as well as some of the uh, return to work activities that I'm doing. For employers, um, if you, so I really don't have a, a huge amount of time, but if you need help in terms of just urgent care, uh, we, we will make time to get that done. Uh, this webinar is, as I mentioned, a quick, easy, inexpensive way to find out if you've got that problem of prediabetes that you and your doc have not, not been aware of. If you've got a CIMT, you didn't have a doc available to review it, then uh, yes, we're, doing, we're making some of that information available as well, and we'll keep you posted on the book. So uh, now we'll get into the, uh, the program for today, Carl. So, have you ever heard of the term biological or molecular clock? It can look at things that happen on a fairly um, regular basis within biology and you go back, you start, if you're able to count those things, you're, you're able to start making some estimates regarding how long something's been going on. Well, viruses mutate as they, reg as they rep replicate and these mutations can be used as a molecular clock to track a virus through time and geography. That's what they're starting to do with coronavirus. University College Lon London Genetics Institute researcher Felix, oh, excuse me, Francois Balou and his team pulled viral sequences from a giant global database for COVID or for coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2. Well, and we will th those three words are actually three different have three different meanings, which we'll cover a little bit later. They looked at the samples taken at different times and places. They indicated that the virus only started infecting people, humans, at the end of 2019, not very long before the virus was identified. This rule, according to him, this rules out any scenario that assumes that SARS-CoV-2 may have been circulation in humans long before it was identified and hence have already infected large uh, proportions of the population. The team wrote in a, in a report that's published in Genetics uh, and uh, Evolution. Now that can be bad news. Why? Some doctors had hoped the virus was circulating for many months and quietly infected more people than reported. No, I, I, uh, I think that conclusion uh, is pretty reliably wrong. I don't think we've got a lot of uh, people that have been, been infected for many months and just didn't know it. They hoped that some immunity had already been built in some populations. And again, no, I think this is a new introduction. As I think I've mentioned, coronavirus is a family um, of viruses. A couple of them have been around forever, for, for as long as we've been able to delineate families. But this specific coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, has also probably been around in been around for years, but in populations like bat populations, not in the human population. Um, this, in, this information supports the conclusion that uh, many of us already had, that this is a new introduction. I came to that conclusion personally because, again, you don't see this kind of spread um, in something that's been around for months and months. 
a long time before this. SARS-CoV-2 is said to have originated in bats, but might have infected other animals before jumping to humans. Um, we have a major issue with a similar type of virus, similar family in uh, dromedids, camels. We know there's significant uh, viral population in camels. And we also know uh, that camels are like horses uh, for a large portion of, of mankind. And we're not, um, we're not going to be able to, to, it's not practical to think that humans will minimize exposure to camels. The first human cases of SARS-CoV-2 were reported in Wuhan, China last December. Our results are in line with previous estimates and point to all sequences sharing a common ancestor toward the end of 2019. Supporting this is the period when SARS-CoV-2 jumped into its human hosts, according to the researchers. Uh, nevertheless, the virus's mutations do uh, provide evidence of quick spread. The virus is said to be already infecting uh, uh, people in Europe, the U.S., and elsewhere weeks before the first reported cases in January and February. And because of that, it's not going to be, uh, we're not going to find patient zero for those countries. However, there's no evidence that the virus is mutating to become even more contagious or more fatal. I would argue with that. And I would say, I don't think these guys were, at the time they wrote this report, I don't think they were aware of the Los Alamos report that was coming out at, at right about the same time. I think the Los Alamos report that we reported on, was it yesterday? Oh, the days sort of fog into my memory here. Uh, we reported on that. Uh, I think it was D16, 613G or something like that. I do believe that the evidence is pretty strong for that mutation. So um, I also think that the evidence is not as strong regarding uh, whether it's more virulent. I, I think it probably isn't, but I think the evidence is also pretty strong that it is more contagious. Uh, if you begin to look at that, that um, Los Alamos mutation, D613G, or again, somebody fact, fact check me on the, the, the letters and the number, <clears throat> uh, the earlier uh, Europe-based coronavirus uh, mutation was, was what started in the first few days in, um, in the New York area, and it appeared within a few days that it was replaced by the, more, by the other one, the uh, Los Alamos mutation. And you're, you're not going to replace that. It's not going to replace that that quickly unless it's significantly more contagious. So, Carl, you want to go ahead and give us the, um, the video? As COVID-19 infects people around the world, it's more important than ever to track the spread and evolution of the virus in order to guide and inform control strategies. But how do you track a virus? Well, SARS-CoV-2 the virus that causes COVID-19, behaves a little bit like a game of telephone. As the whispered sentence is passed from one person to the next, it might change ever so slightly. Data on SARS-CoV-2 show that it mutates at an average of about two mutations per month. And we know this because scientists all around the world are collecting samples from patients with COVID-19 and sequencing the virus, reading its genetic code. Leading the effort from the University of Sheffield is one of our members, Dr. Tushan De Silva. He's a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Sheffield and an honorary consultant physician in infectious diseases. He told us that as the virus travels within or between countries, it can mutate as it reacts to evolutionary pressure from localised populations. This can be due to immune responses or drugs active against the virus and can create slightly different strains. Over time, this could result in strains that are resistant to drugs, therefore it's important to track. And even once we have a vaccine for COVID-19, Continually sequencing the virus will still be vital in making sure that the vaccine is effective against all strains. Dr De Silva and his colleagues are part of a national effort to sequence the genomes of hundreds, perhaps thousands of genomes each week over the next few months. In Sheffield alone, they've sequenced around 60 strains so far. This data is then fed into a global database that can track the progression of the virus in real time. Rapid data sharing like this is key to understanding whether the virus is changing and how it's being transmitted.
So in case you didn't get it, we are transitioning over into the Q&A. I started it off with uh, my question. Have, are you taking care of yourself? Have you actually had an OGTT or, and or a uh, insulin survey? And Dave Murphy's response was, I'm working on getting that accomplished. Good morning, Dave, and thank you for doing that. Thanks for your concern. Um, yes, we do appreciate uh, donations, but again, one of the things that I, um, I was asking myself and continue to ask myself is, again, we appreciate uh, the donations to help uh, move the, the program out and available to other people, but why not make sure that you focus, spend a little bit of money, and this is not a lot, to find out if you are in danger. Um, <clears throat> Kurt Harnish, listening. Greg Hartlaub, good morning. It, it wasn't showing at first on YouTube. He did some things and now it's showing up. So thank you, Greg. And now we've had the comments jump on us. I'll see if I can. Robert Simpson, good morning. Dave Murphy, is the lockdown actually preventing deaths? or is it just delaying the inevitable? Unless you isolate indefinitely, won't you eventually be exposed? Well, there's two, just like so many other things, Dave, there's obviously two ways of looking at that. Here's my perspective. Um, if you were in that very first wave in New York, for example, or uh, in the, the peak at Italy, and you got it when we didn't know anything about the drugs. We didn't know anything about preventive uh, supplements like uh, vitamin D3. We didn't know anything about that. We were very, very um, undercapitalized for uh, hospital space and ventilators. Yeah, you, you, you may have been no more infected than somebody that's going to get infected over the next six to 18 months, but I'd much rather be infected later than sooner. Uh, the human species is very, very good. At, I mean, we're, we're not so good at discipline. We're not so good at diet. Sometimes we're not so good at uh, weight loss. We're not so good at uh, preventive procedures to protect our health. We're not so good at making sure that we've got masks in case something like this happens. But once something like this happens, we're pretty good at responding to it. And I think over the next six to 18 months, we're going to have a heck of a lot more uh, countermeasures available for this. So the longer I can delay on a personal basis, the, uh, the better. And I think that I think that's a, an obvious choice for most folks. Alex Sweden. Good morning, Doc. I suggest folks with pre-diabetic, full diabetic issues to read the book Blood Sugar 101 by Jenny Rule. Thank you, Alex. That's a great, uh, a great item. It's helped me to bring down my hemoglobin A1C from 6.2 to 5.2 in a few months. You know, Alex, uh, there are maybe a half dozen of books that I recommend. Uh, a lot of book people recommend uh, Brad Bale and Amy Donine's Beat the Heart Attack Gene. And a lot of my patients in the uh, dental community have read that. But to me, even more important is this book, Blood Sugar 101 by Jenny Rule, and uh, The Diabetes Epidemic in You by Joseph Kraft. Um, Jenny Rule's book is very practical. She's got an award-winning uh, diabetes site that, uh, and it, it's got the same name, uh, Blood Sugar 101. If you just read for the first hour that book, Blood Sugar 101, you get a whole different perspective regarding Yes, this is a disease of aging and you need to be careful and problems are totally preventable. We're just not looking. So thank you again, Alex. It's a great, uh, a great topic to cover. I would also add uh, Dr. Kraft's book is a little bit quirky in terms of this, the writing style, but, but it's just, it's incredibly powerful in showing that again, uh, Insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes is number one, um, way underrecognized, and number two, very much a disease of aging. Bob Bell, Dave, a vaccine would solve the problem of getting the virus, a treatment to prevent death, and also change things. Delay gives times for developing both. 
Oh, and I forgot to mention, thank you so much, Bob. You're right. I don't think it's going to take us a full 18 months for, uh, for significant vaccine development. And I do think there will be more vi antiviral treatments out there too. So J uh, Jan H, should OGTT be the two hour or four hour test to determine prediabetes? Will my physician agree to the OGTT despite a fasting blood sugar of 91 and an o A1C of 5.1? Thank you. Three or four really critical points here. I've seen two patients this week that had normal, um, normal blood sugars, normal uh, A1C. One of them had an A1C below five, believe it or not. I haven't seen that before, but um, in combination with the rest of what I would, I'm gonna tell you, it isn't that they had normal values, it was that they had normal values and they had very significant um, insulin resistance and one of them already had very significant plaque. If you looked at the, um, the insulin levels on these individuals, um, one of them had an insulin level going up uh, way over 150 and staying over 100. And the basal insulin was in the 20s. And uh, many of you already know, there's a good debate and it, there's a lot of potential for the, the debate to say, insulin in and of itself may be more inflammatory than high blood sugar. So you've got a lot of people out there who have normal blood sugars, normal fasting blood sugars, normal uh, or, or near normal A1Cs, but they're having to pump out a lot of insulin, way too much insulin in order to keep those blood sugar numbers low. So very, very good points. Now, should it be two hour or four hour? I find tons and tons of stuff. The vast majority of mine have been two hour. I have a few patients who do have the, uh, the patients, pardon the pun, to go ahead and do the four hour. Uh, we just got agreement just a couple of months ago, um, n November, I think, from, um, from Quest to do a three or four hour if the patient wishes. So um, here's what I would suggest. Start with the two hour and we can tell a heck of a lot from that. Don't just look at blood sugar, look at insulin as well. Anonymous, USA 3300 STB airborne pandemic was circulating in the population before the new coronavirus. Not sure what you're talking about, Anonymous. Um, a little bit more details uh, would be helpful. For example, the detail of what is USA 300-ST8 or B. Uh, Joe Riley, Jan H, if a physician doesn't, if, if the physician doesn't want to order those, it's time to change docs. You know, I agree. However, you know, I've got a lot of patients that are in small towns. They don't really have access to a lot of docs. And that's why we've set this up where you don't have to change docs to see me. You can come in, we can get the critical information regarding cardiovascular inflammation, insulin resistance, um, prediabetes that you need to know. Then once you take that information back, I haven't seen anybody uh, who, well, I have. I've seen some doctors who'd said, look, this was, this test is rigged to fail. And at that point, then it becomes a little bit more um, focused on whether or not do you need to use another doctor to manage that part of your care. And yep, I've got several patients that are doing just that. But most docs, once confronted with that information, are not bad, you know, just they're like other people. They're not bad people. They say, hmm, dang, I didn't know that. And what do you want to do next? And approach, most docs do approach this from a very different perspective. They'll often approach it as arrogant and I'm the expert, again, until presented with this kind of information. And then quite often they'll change their tune. If they don't, again, there are options for you. Uh, Wan Jin, Chinese CCP, uh, Chinese Communist Party made the virus. They want to destroy the world. Well, obviously, Wan is a conspiracy theorist, and there are a whole lot of them out there. Um, this is not what this channel is about. I, I personally think that clearly they're ethically and morally capable of it. I just don't know that 
they can actually execute. Uh, Dave Murphy, Bob, yes, there is already a treatment to prevent, uh, correct the more, more comorbidity issues. Hippocrates, before you heal someone, ask him if he's uh, willing to give up the things that made him sick. Very, very good point, Dave. Thank you so much. Alex Sweden, COVID-19 is an issue, but diabetics and prediabetes are far bigger pandemics than COVID-19. And it's been overlooked. Thank you so much, Alex. That's exactly the point. You know, uh, Joe Riley called us one day uh, after one of these meetings and said, Doc, can you just maybe put up the numbers of people that are actually dying from COVID-19 versus the numbers of people that are um, dying from heart attack and stroke, prediabetes? Uh, there's some challenges, but we worked out a way to where we can at least give those estimates. We've actually gotten some pushback on that. A lot of people say, well, that's not what I'm seeing. Where did you get that number? So here's where we got the number uh, that we start the show with um, for that comparison. The COVID-19 comes right off of the, uh, the COVID-19 comes off of the Hopkins and the other, um, the other website. Those are clear. Everybody's focused on those and you got a website to confirm that with. Not quite so easy with the week by week death rate for heart attack and stroke. Um, what we did to get those, those estimates was go back and look at uh, the most uh, recent available yearly uh, death rates and just multiply those out week by week. Now, as we know, there's gonna be a lot of overlap because the same people that were gonna be having the heart attack and stroke now are, getting, are dying from COVID-19 but they're still also dying from heart attack and stroke. So thank you so much for raising that, Alex. And that is exactly my point. As usual, I mean, humans have their good points and their bad points, but uh, one of our good points is not the ability to plan and not the ability to see through the forest for the trees. And yes, it's prediabetes, it's killing us, not some preventable stuff, not so much uh, a virus itself. I, the, um, the, we've got a lot of comments coming through. We've jumped over and, uh, if I've, if I've ended up skipping you and you want, please just be aware and, and resubmit. COVID-19 is an issue. Okay. So actually we're there. Jan H. I've decided that I need a primary for hangnails and colonoscopies and Dr. Brewer for preventive medicine. My network can't do LP little A tests. Uh, thank you, Chuck K. And a lot of folks are in that in that situation. There are not a lot of uh, preventive medicine docs out there. Um, one of the reasons is preventive medicine docs spend most of their time talking, educating, set or, or managing public health programs. Um, they don't end up making a lot of money. I was an exception in that role in that I did a whole lot of work helping employers, large employers manage their populations. So my focus right now is not, not finances. My focus is getting that message out there. And I wish there were a lot of preventive docs uh, available. There's just not. <clears throat> Bob Bell, Jan, there are a number of recent studies that are pinpointing the 30 minute and one hour uh, greater than 155 reading is most significant predictor. The standard predictor is to use the two hour reading greater than 140. Thank you, Bob. And those are some reasonable numbers. Um, optimum, by the way, Bob, would be to not peak, to not go over 120 at any peak. Um, but as you know, if you use that number, uh, there are very few people that would pass that test. Bob Bell, but why not get the two hour and cover both? Better yet, contact Meridian Valley and get the craft test. And we do offer that Meridian Valley. We've done that for a lot of folks and you can get it on your own as many folks have, have demonstrated already. You don't need us to get this information uh, to find it out and then move to the next level <clears throat> in terms of uh, protecting your health. Jackie Shaheen, Doc, have you worked with vanadium? Actually, uh, very, very minimally for those of you who are familiar with it, at least if you're talking about the vanadium I'm talking about, it's a, uh, it's a poison. I did a lot of work in occupational medicine working with employers. Uh, I was board certified in, in occupational medicine as well as prevention. 
And uh, <clears throat> vanadium is a um, metallic type of um, toxin that causes a thing called green tongue. So we've almost uh, tapped everything that I remember, at least right now, about vanadium. Joe Riley, would it be desirable to be vaccinated with more than one vaccine? Well, that depends. Right now, we don't have any vaccines that are uh, available. Uh, Jeffrey B. Ehlers, so how do we treat high insulin? Well, there are two major components. First of all, there are supplements that help, you know, cinnamon, um, uh, bergamot, bergamine, uh, this next, there are medications, uh, metformin, um, pioglitazone is very powerful for insulin resistance for the root cause, but you cannot medicate, you cannot supplement your way out of a lifestyle. Um, you treat high insulin by dealing with the cause, and there are two major causes for that. Besides aging, you can't do anything about getting younger, but there are two other major issues. Uh, one is your body composition. Too much fat, too little muscle mass greatly increases your insulin. Um, eating carbs pushes insulin every time you eat carbs. Now, people will say, well, amino acids, protein does as well. Not nearly as much. If you can just uh, start managing the carb component of your uh, diet, I have plenty of people with with major full-blown diabetes that are managing uh, and keeping their blood sugars 120, even 100 or less. And it's same pattern over and over and over again. They lose 30 pounds, 40 pounds, uh, those that are able to. And those that don't have that much to lose, lose what they can lose in terms of body fat, increase their muscle mass, and most importantly, manage the carbs in their diet. That takes a while. It takes a few weeks if you've never, I had a patient just uh, yesterday where he didn't know that he had this problem. We had actually been looking at him for a while. He had LP little a, but I suspected there might be something else going on. And we found out sure enough, this was the first time we were able to get the insulin response and insulin values just out the roof. He had, he had sort of, quote, avoided carbs, but he'd not really gotten into the carb counting. You don't have to carb count forever, but for a few weeks, you need to learn to do that. So there's some major changes that you need to set up. Once you set them up, they're not that painful, but they're very protective. Great question, Jeffrey. Thanks for asking. Gary Mar Marasigan, are cloth face masks enough to protect us from COVID-19? No. If not, then why are governments telling us to use this instead of actual PPEs? Well, in the beginning, we didn't have enough and we still don't have, you know, the actual PPE. Uh, for those of you who don't know, PPE stands for personal protective equipment. So if you look at an infectious disease like this and managing that infectious disease, uh, and you look at any of the standard requirements, um, that would have us in what we call, what people term as a full moon suit with an air supply. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. That's not going to happen um, anytime soon. So I think that's the easy and obvious answer to your question. And then like any other questions, you can say, well, doc, you're being, you know, you're being, you're speaking in hyperbole. And I meant, well, if you meant something more detailed, let me know. Dave Ferguson, what is the approximate cost of a freestyle Libre? Uh, it varies on the, the pharmacy that you go to. It's between 30 and 70 bucks. That gives you two full weeks of complete um, uh, blood sugar testing. And it ends up coming out to be uh, comparable for folks that are doing a whole lot of finger sticks. I wouldn't see it as an either or. You do need to use finger sticks to confirm numbers that you suspect. Um, and you bring up a good point and ability for me to go down another brief bunny hole. Don't expect, unless you've got uncontrolled diabetes, don't expect for your insurance company to pay for this. Insurance companies are only paying for CGM, including Libre, 
for people that are clearly already just burning their arteries out, people that have full-blown, uncontrolled, known diabetes. Don't even submit it. Don't try. It's, they're just not going to go there. Can you use the Libre to give yourself an OGTT? I've got plenty of people have done that. It's like a, a poor man's OGTT. You may have heard some of the chatter back and forth with uh, folks like Tom Tigner and, uh, and um, Joe Riley talking about home uh, insulin testing. When that becomes available, that will be huge for the reasons that we have discussed. And there's a company out saying that they can do it. I've got some friends who are lab experts who are checking them out right now. Gary Marisigan, or Marisigan, Marisig Marisigan. Not sure how to pronounce that. I understand that the supply is short, but I feel like I'm being sent to battle with an armor made of leather and that they tell me that everything will be all right. Well, Gary, there was a, I, I, yeah, you, I, I'm not gonna argue with that. There was a major uh, publicity campaign by the doctors in Germany. They posed for pictures in the nude um, they didn't show any private body parts, but they were making a point. Uh, they were hiding behind uh, tissue paper and things like that. And their point was, we're here at war and a lot of us are dying because we don't have sufficient PPE. That's a big deal. And it's not just you, Gary. It's a whole lot of people. And a lot of people have died because of that. As I said, Human beings are sometimes not so good at planning. We had plenty of warning as a species that this was gonna happen and we needed masks. Masks were, we had very tenuous supplies for masks and other type of PPE. So it is what it is. Jan H, Jason Fong in the Diabetic Code has opened my eyes to my probable pre-diabetes. I routinely get 160 plus readings on Freestyle Libre. Yep, I'd say a lot more than probable pre-diabetes, Jen, uh, with a piece of bread and a banana. Ouch. Yep. Thank you for getting the message. Now you know some of the next stuff to do. Thank you for actually making that effort, Jan. That can save you 20 good years of health, healthy life. Dave Murphy, David F., I found the Freestyle Libre for around 115 for a pack of two with a coupon from Good Rx. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Um, Robert Simpson, I don't think we should be banking on a vaccine no time soon. It may take up to five years to get one. Well, uh, Robert, you may be right. I hope not. And <clears throat> my perspective that you're not, that we're going to have something which is helpful in far less than that is not based on just wild guesses. But again, we'll see. Danny Dutcher, I don't know what you're doing for wrinkles, Doc, but, but you look 20 years younger in the face. What's your secret? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, you can tell from this little uh, turkey waddle there. I'm, yes, I'm in my early 60s. So um, I I've always been told I, uh, I look young. In fact, it didn't always work to my favor. When I finished med school and what age, it was 22 or 21, and I had a, a lot of people, especially uh, older ladies when, in the GYN rotation, say, I'm sorry, doc, I just, I don't want to be examined by you. You just look like my son who's in high school. So uh, at these, these days, I love hearing that I look younger. I didn't like it so much when I was younger. Thanks for the comment. David F., I plan to do the freestyle eventually, just need to prioritize expenditures at this point. Thank you, Dave Murphy. Robert Simpson, what's the highest A1C you have seen? 15. Um, that was in a young man who had type 1 diabetes, and he had actually had some very, very significant tissue destruction uh, of the skin. His diabetes was obviously out of control. Uh, by the time he came to see me, he'd been through that hospitalization and said, you know what, I'm going to start taking care of this. He, he at that time, still had one of the higher uh, A1Cs that I was dealing with at that point. It was like eight or nine. Uh, but then when I found out and I started talking with him and finding out it had been that high, it was like, oh. 
Dave Murphy, the Deacons, though, the Dexcom 6 is more expensive than the Freestyle. Is it worth it? Why or why not? Well, it, you know, just like everything else, Dave, it depends. To me, uh, uh, the Dexcom 6 has a lot of advantages, and especially folks who have very high expectations of their uh, CGM device. They want that number to be right every time. They're not looking for patterns. They want numbers. Uh, your Dexcom 6 is better. Uh, in my perspective, I didn't get as good. I tried both at the same time, and I really didn't get as good numbers off the Dexcom 6. I also ended up putting it a little bit too low on my belly, and it kept running into my uh, belt. I also don't have very much belly fat at all. Uh, so it was not comfortable. The, the Freestyle Libre that I was putting on the back of my arm, I just I don't even notice it once I put it on. I have to do other things to remember to even use it. So, again, that's why I tend to talk about Libre, but there's clearly a bunch of folks. Doug Thompson, for example, the, the dentist that came on before, uh, I've given him a few of each, and he clearly prefers the uh, Dexcom 6. And, again, you know, he's a, he's a dentist. He wants the right number. He doesn't want to worry about uh, – he wants – well, and he and I actually had a – uh, a smackdown and one of the uh, Chuck Smith asked us to step step up in the uh, in the Lex in the Louisville event and basically compare the two and uh, hopefully we'll be getting that Louisville event the courses out or uh, Aspen just completed the uh, the videos on that course we're not sure of a price point yet but we were thinking about something a little bit less than 300 bucks to attend the entire course uh, without the two days and the uh, buying the labs and all of that stuff. So um, if it, over the next month or so, we'll uh, have some information where you can see some of that uh, knocked down, that head-to-head uh, -head comparison between um, Freestyle uh, Libre and the uh, Dexcom. Good question, thank you. The Dexcom 6, okay. Uh, Metabolic, 1350. Metabolic, that's from Joe Riley, and what he's talking about is the company that's coming out saying, we can give you a way to test for insulin in your home. Danny Dutcher, do you offer the courses for Canadians? I offer those courses all over the world, Danny. Thank you so much for asking. And yes, uh, we offer the courses all over the world. I've got patients all over the world that I've seen. Uh, face, some of them I've seen face to face when they were here in the States. Um, many of them I've done Skype with or uh, Zoom or go to a meeting. Um, I've got uh, a lot of Canadians as well. So in terms of being patients, in terms of uh, buying and using the courses, in terms of doing the, uh, the webinars. And I expect to have Canadians and other nationalities in these subscriptions as well. So thank you so much, Danny, for that question. Uh, Danny Dutcher, autophagy, maybe. Not sure where that's coming from, Dave. Um, I must have missed a couple of questions back. Jackie Shaheen, have you heard anything about Apigen receiving a government contract to provide 500 milliliters vaccine injectors? I haven't, Jackie. Sorry. Sax Girl Horn Boy, as someone else here pointed out recently, even one Libre sensor worn for two weeks will give you a wealth of information. There's no question. Like they say, it's like watching a movie after only glancing at still images. Absolutely no question. Thanks for uh, for bringing that up, Sax Girl. That's why I keep repeating that. You know, it's like, guys, we are flying blind. How would you like for your airline pilot to occasionally get a picture every, you know, few minutes or a few seconds of what's going on? Wouldn't you want them to know what's going on in real time? And, well, you say, well, that's my life. Well, what about your blood sugar levels? That's your life, too. And that's, that's where the, we've got so much disconnect out there. Thank you so much, Sax Girl. Bob Bell, Jan H., if you have a Freestyle Libre, you can use, use it to do an OGTT. I use Mountain Dew, 20 ounces, 77 grams sugar as the sugar dose. 
Yes, uh, the Mountain Dew Freestyle Libre OGTT is a very popular version of an at-home OGTT. They, by the way, you can do these. You don't have to have a Libre. You can do those. You can go. To the, you don't have to have a prescription. The Libre is a prescription thing. And again, as I've mentioned, we we do we have services to make those available. But you can do this with uh, finger sticks, finger strips. Um, Dave Murphy, Joe, you could get the doctor's office version of Metabolic for seventy-five hundred. Wow, guys, well, financially we're incredibly comparable. I mean, not comparable. We're incredibly less expensive. Roger Dodger, my wife has lost thirty pounds. Saying eating says she's under thirty grams healthy carbs per meal. Is that considered low carb? Well, what I recommend people do is number one, start counting carbs to know what they're doing. First of all, it's a learning process. I would suggest starting with a hundred grams of uh, healthy carbs. And then you start getting into questions of, well, wait a minute, how, how glycemic, we're talking about glycemic carbs, non-glycemic carbs. Once you start getting into that space, then you start, um, you start finding that there are a little bit deeper questions in that space. But I, 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 it's a very practical thing to start learning and start planning on 100 grams per day or less. Then you can start deciding about uh, glycemic carbs and 50 grams or less, things like that. And it's probably usually better to, to look at it on a daily basis because that gives you a little bit more flexibility. Chuck K, thanks for bringing Dr. Thompson to our conversation, expanding our knowledge in a new area is extremely valuable. Thank you for your interest and your recognition. Roger, matter of perspective, I do what I consider low carb, less than 20 total carbs per day. And Dave, I'll just remind him that you shared with us, what, a week or two ago that you've uh, lo recently lost, what, uh, more than 100 pounds. So low carb, cutting those carbs is very effective at, um, at decreasing weight as well. 30 is way better than 100. <clears throat> no question about that, Joe Riley. And then we're going to wrap it up. You only need to use freestyle for about a month per year to show your patterns. I would recommend for most folks, Joe, um, to look at more like a quarter, uh, one time per quarter. Um, and not the full month, just a, a two week period, like each quarter. And you start getting a much better picture of what's going on. After doing a couple of these, you start to understand what you respond to in terms of exercise, in terms of food, in terms of other patterns. And again, you don't need to be doing, I think one of your key points, and I couldn't agree more, you don't have to do this and keep that on all the time. It's not like you have to know every minute of every day. There's been studies that look at this and people don't do a lot better once they get beyond like 20, 25% of their time. And those are people with full-blown diabetes, uh, people with run of the mill with most versions of pre-diabetes pre really don't need to do it 25%. Uh, Dave Murphy, Carnometer is the best carb count app I've found. More detailed. I've heard the same thing. I've looked at it. I've reviewed it. I haven't used it. Uh, personally, but a lot of my patients are using a Alex Sweden. I, Doc, I haven't checked my insulin level. What's the best time to test to give a clear idea of the insulin level? There's two things, two at least two times you need to check, Alex. One is at fasting that morning, usually in the morning after you fasted for eight hours, because you want that to be five or less. That's basal insulin. The other is um, <clears throat> after a challenge, and I would recommend. 30 minutes, an hour, and two hours at least after that challenge to see what happens in terms of your insulin response. I've had people that have a totally normal basal insulin and then go up over 150 after that challenge. So uh, early thoughts, basal insulin would have been, that would have been okay. But after looking deeper after that challenge, not so much. Uh, Jan H. Bombell, if I use the Mountain Dew, is the com comparable to 75 grams glucose? Close enough. I, I, it, yes, it's, and, and people might say, well, wait a minute, that's fructose. Fructose doesn't raise your blood sugar. I've got plenty of people that have done the, uh, done those using, um, <clears throat> using Mountain Dew. I don't know why people love Mountain Dew so much. I guess it's the, uh, 
the caffeine, but a lot of people use it. And maybe it's because I'm here in Kentucky. Thank you so much for your interest and uh, we'll see you later.